Okay, so how did you then go from being okay. excommunicated to starting up sort of an ex, you know. So from a, there, for the next year, I just sat in a Christian church and listened and read the Bible until two and three and four o'clock in the mornings, absorbing just the Bible itself. And I have, I, at least I don't have it anymore. I'm lucky if I can remember my name by the time we're done with this. Uh, but when I was in my 40s, I had almost like a, a photographic memory. I could, I could tell you, you know, if somebody asked me a question, I'd say, well, that's in Journal of Discourses, Volume 8, page 72. I mean, I could pull that stuff out. So the word was fresh and alive in me, and I was really excited. And this is where it happened. There were people from the church who were now asking me, and one of my friends, his name was George, we spent six hours at a, at a uh, Denny's type restaurant, just talking, and he gave his life to Jesus Christ. He was my first convert, and he's still the same. But uh, I was talking to Mormons and friends about it, and I did a Bible study one time, just asking, answering questions and stuff about the church. I wasn't organized. I was reading the book of Nehemiah, and in the book of Nehemiah, there's a section that I can't quote anymore. When Nehemiah was talking to the king, he had a burden for his people, and he wanted the king to release him to go back and build the wall, repair the wall. You remember that? And so I was reading that, and I literally began to weep and sob and felt that I had to go back to my people, the Mormon people. And my wife is waving me at leaving. Bye, honey. Bye. And uh, we've been married 50 years now. Wow. Anyway. Nice. Uh, so, so I just got this weeping heart, broken heart for the Mormon people. And you were basically afraid they weren't going to go to heaven. I knew they weren't by now. Okay. And so I began calling up and people from the church that I was attending were telling other people and people were having missionaries over and they're ready to join the Mormon church. They called me and I'd come in and sit down with my triple combination and, and sit there and, and uh, uh, question the missionaries. And uh, next thing I know I was doing, I was doing people's Bible studies. Uh, people were from churches were having me speak at, at classes. What uh, what city were you living in during this in the time? Seattle area. You're in the Seattle area. Yeah, and so uh, so I, I I was running. I was trying to run a business. I was an executive in a in a menswear and ski wear company, and had 1,800 people working under me. I was a vice president and and uh, dealing with all the business, and then trying to shove all this stuff in in between. It was driving me nuts, and. Uh, uh, I finally discovered that I really had to do something that was going to be more productive and reach more people. Uh, about that same time, uh, I wrote the, a little booklet called Tomorrow Night with Love. And that was my first actual product that we would hand out to Mormons and hand out. And Around what year was that? Uh, 78, 77. And then, then a guy named Pat Patriciana asked me to come and be interviewed for a movie that he was making with Dave Hunt, who was an author and a, uh, an apologist. Uh, and it was called, uh, 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 I can't think of the name of it. It was uh, Cult Explosion was the name of the movie. And I met Dave Hunt there. And Dave Hunt said to me, why don't we write a book? You know, and we wrote the God Makers book. Okay, let me back, let me pause for a second and just ask you a couple of questions that you may or may not have answers to. So, so in the okay, so first of all, Fawn Brody, you know, niece of David O. McKay, she wrote No Man Knows My History I back in like forty five, I think. Yeah. Would you have been aware of Fawn Brody's work in the 
50s, 60s, or 70s? It, no. it, do you no. remember? No. Had you even read it by the time, by, by the late 70s when you're writing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. So I as a Mormon, you wouldn't have read that? No. And, and, and what happened was that at the little church that we were going to, there was a class that was being taught that I was, I was in a couple's class. I wasn't in the, this one other class. And the guy was going on vacation. And he said to me on a Sunday leaving the church, he said, Ed, I'm going to be gone next week. And we're studying Mormonism. There's a chapter in this book about Mormonism. Would you read it over and you lead the class because you're an ex-Mormon? And I opened it up and it was, it was Kingdom, uh, Kingdom of the Cults by Walter Martin. Okay. And, uh, so you, so, so have you read No Man Knows My History since? Oh yeah. I've given hundreds of copies away of it. I think it's a phen phenomenal book. Okay. But up until, up until. No, you... no, the only, the first anti-Mormon book that I ever saw in my life was, was Cult Explosion. Okay. Uh, so were you aware of the work of Gerald and Sandra Tanner in the 60s or 70s? No, no. in the 70s, yes, yeah, not in the 60s. But but even up at up at this point, like were you by the oh, time yeah, you're no, starting by the time you're starting to write pamphlets about Mormonism, were you aware of Gerald and Sandra Tanner? No. Really? Really. Because they're okay. kind of a little bit of your your slant from the standpoint of kind of being born again Christians, trying to Bring people to Christ, trying to convince people the church isn't true. Yeah, but I wasn't even there. I was still, I was still in my own little bubble. Yeah, no, 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 I get it, and there's no internet. The bubble, the bubble broke, and I got ahead of myself there. The bubble broke when the guy gave me Walter Martin's book, uh, Kingdom of the Cults, and asked me to do the class. I read the book. I read the article. I read the chapter. Fire came out of my ears and said, this guy is a total liar. And so I went back that next Sunday with a flannel board <laughs> board yeah I sure do and taught them and all those people just sat there and didn't say a word to me and smiled as I taught them Mormonism and I walked out the door that day and gave the pastor the book in his gut I just slammed him with it and said this book's full of lies and he said if you can pull if you can if you can prove it wrong then then I'll take the book out of the whole denomination Okay, so you're saying the anti-Mormon book, the chapter about Mormonism in the anti-cult book, was not accurate? According to me. And so you wanted to provide a more accurate sort of version of, let's just say, anti-Mormonism. You said, if we're going to attack the church, let's be accurate. That's where I ran into the Tanner's book. The only book that was out at the time was this great big three, uh, great big eight and a half by 11 thing of copies of things mormonism shadow and reality probably yeah, right I, yeah the first, i found that in a bookstore in in eugene oregon for, of, of all places and and it was all underlined and but even that didn't get to me i i i got on a plane i went to salt lake city and i went to the church headquarters and i went into there was a library place there and i was starting to look at trying to get the we didn't have the internet back then. Okay. It hadn't been invented yet. So what I was doing was I had Walter Martin's book and I had the chapter and I was taking every quote that he had and looking for the original document. And I spent about a week or 10 days in Utah discovered that every single reference that he made and every statement he made was absolutely correct. There was not one error in what he said. Oh, so he was, you felt he was accurate. I found out I was very angry that he wasn't accurate. Oh, because you didn't, you didn't know that you didn't know that you didn't know the history of Mormonism up until that point. Yeah. So you and, felt and, like and they were all into Mormon lies. That's the same thing that happens with Mormons today. Yeah. It's like they're cafeteria Mormons. They take what they want. And when they hear something that's not in their tray on their tray, They'd say, "Oh, that's not Mormonism. I, uh, it, you know, you misrepresented us." Or right. You, I've done. I've listened to that for forty-four years. Sure, 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 sure. And I just want Did to you... say here, for the record, that I have been accused of writing false information, incorrect. I've lied. I've misrepresented. That I, I have used false quotes and and taken something from here and put it together with something here to make my point. I have said for forty years. Show me one error. 
and I'll leave. I'll, I'll, I'll drop my minute. Okay. So we're going to get to that when we talk about the God makers. So I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Did you meet, did you look up Gerald and Sandra Tanner when you came to Salt Lake? Yes, I did. I did that. And you met him? Yeah. What did you think of Gerald and Sandra Tanner back in the late seventies? Well, I saw what they were doing. They, they were, they were, you know, they seemed to be nice people. They were copying, copying all these things and finding all the old books and records and stuff. And, and pointing out the things that were non-biblical. Did you respect that? Yes. Okay. Did I, you become friends? Them. Did you become friends with them? I can't be sort of friends with them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We we communicated when I had I started running conferences in Utah every year, and I had them there, and I you know I I uh, I, I used them uh, in a couple of films that I was part of, and and I use them in in most of my three or four films. We used we use them freely. Gerald and I had a serious falling apart, falling away uh, because of something I said. And he decided that all I, that I was saying that the temple, the God of the temple was, a, was the devil or Lucifer and that I was seeing demons every, under every rock. Uh, we never reconciled. And, and uh, that was the end of that. I still say that Lucifer is, is the God of the Mormon temple and the very teaching that I did that caused the relationship to fracture with the, with the, uh, with the Tanners was a, a, a teaching that's on my website. It's called the sure sign of the nail. And it tells it exactly, you know, I wouldn't, I, Walter Martin was traveling with me in Utah when we did that series. And he told me that night, he said, that is going to cause a lot of problems with some of these people. But he said, you are absolutely accurate. Every word you said. Well, you so, were teaching that, that I Satan is the, ritual, that, Satan, said, you know, that Lucifer is the what? The true God of the Mormon temple. How? How is that true? Re read, read my story. No, just give, it, give me a one minute explanation. Who, who, who teaches Mormon true doctrine in the Mormon temple? Who's the one that Adam and Eve meet? Who's the one that, uh, is standing there when Adam says, "What are those? What are you, what are those things on on your on your uh, apron?" And Lucifer says, "These are the these are the powers of my priesthood. These are the marks and power of my priesthood." Right. So I and so saying, as hey, someone wait, wait, as wait, someone wait. who just a second. Wait. So as someone who went through the temple, who was Mormon for decades, uh, and who studied a lot, like what I took that to mean was that Satan kind of represent the world, that Satan does have power and priesthood, but the evil type, and that oh, he was at, he, wait, let me just finish, and that he was in the garden trying to lead Adam and Eve in the wrong direction. And, and then God, you know, Jehovah and Michael and, you know, Adam and all those people sent down, you know, angels to cast Satan out and to teach Adam and Eve the true, correct principles. So, I, I can't see how anyone could conclude that Satan was the true. Well, we need we need an hour of my teaching on that. Okay, here you go. I'll try to be as quick as I can. Just, some, just give me the summary. Well, you know, you're talking about a gigantic issue here. I can I can give you a three minute summary. Okay. Okay. When when, when Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden and and he begins to speak Mormon doctrine to them, Adam points to the apron that Lucifer is wearing and says what is that and he points to the markings I remember on. yep I remember that he said, these are the emblems yes I my remember power that. and my priesthood's yeah I remember now, all that yeah I want you to skim straight over to the five points of fellowship at the veil okay and what are you sticking your hands through but the same markings that are on the on Lucifer's apron so for you if you can make a connection between some of the symbols that means that satan no, no, is no. the master no, of mormon satan says i these these the square the compass and the rule of freemasonry that are on the temp, the mormon temple garment are are the same emblems that are on his apron and are on the so, emblems of your undergarments okay. that you got in the anointing and washing room. Okay, so let me get this straight. If Satan in the Mormon temple ceremony has the Masonic symbols on his apron, 
and then the Mormons use the Masonic no, symbols. No, no, go back. Not just that he's wearing them, because we're wearing them on our uh, I know, yeah. Okay. He yeah. says those markings are the emblems of his power and his priesthood. And so if those get reused in other parts of the Mormon ceremony, that They're basically his. means say that what so are you saying that let me just make sure I understand what you're saying. So are you saying that when Joseph Smith and whoever his followers were, when they created the endowment ceremony, in their minds, they're thinking Satan's really the, the Lord and master of no, all. No, I don't think they even knew that. So who so Some came out in the temple ritual? They were they were taking Masonic, they were they were all Masons back there in the Nauvoo era, and they had the, one of the largest Masonic lodges in the in the totally. But wait, I don't want to lose this point. So, in whose mind was Satan? In, by by your understanding, in whose mind was Satan the the leader of the Mormonism or the Mormon temple ceremony? Who thought that? Satan. Okay, so you're saying Satan infected the Mormon temple ceremony. Well, infected is the wrong word. It's like you're you're you're, you're it's like you're saying he did something bad to something good. It was never good. You're saying Satan's the author of the Mormon temple ceremony. Oh, you got it right there. Now, let's go to another place. In the okay, Bible. but you're also saying that God, that, that Joseph Smith and Brigham Young didn't know that they were under the power of Satan when they when they created the Mormon temple ceremony under the inspiration of Satan. I don't what? know their minds. I don't know their minds. I, I, I know the result of what they did. I think oh. every person has been a Mormon and gone through the Mormon temple ritual and is, and is a believer and is wearing their undergarments is bound to Satan. And I'll tell you why. Let me just give you one more thing in the temple ritual about Lucifer. We, we didn't call him Satan there. We called him Lucifer. So after you do all the swearing and throat slitting and all the other stuff and make all these oaths of consecration and everything else uh, and living the law, Satan comes says, now that you've sworn these oaths, if you break one single one of them, I will own you, your mind for. He, he takes custody of you if you break anything right. with those oaths. Okay, I mean, he's the one that uh, mocks, brings the, well, he used to bring the, uh, the, the Christian pastor and, and mocks. Uh, the, uh, I remember. The, yeah. You know. Okay, so I, I'm just going to say, as someone trying to be objective here, to hear your argument, I can see why the Tanners, I can see why the Tanners didn't didn't appreciate or value your interpretation, because I think I think from a Mormon perspective, you're probably taking some leaps that that aren't in the mind and hearts of. I doubt. I you know I have a hard time. I don't believe that Joseph and Brigham were like intentionally thinking Satan's really the master here and we're going to worship no, I, Satan, I, I, but we're going to fool all the Mormons into thinking that it's about God and Jesus, but really, so I don't think it was intentional on God and Jesus's part or on Joseph Smith, the Brigham Young's part to make Satan the, the master of Mormonism. And so you're saying that it was Satan that was making well, well, himself well, well, the who, center who, 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 of, of Mormonism. And I don't think, I don't think there's any evidence for that. That's just kind of you making some associations and then drawing some conclusions without any evidence. Well, that's what you're saying. I don't have evidence. And yet I have, I have enough evidence uh, just in the teaching that I did that night and in, in the, uh, 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 the, the article that I did on it, and the one that I spoke about that 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 uh, uh, the Tanners were very upset about. The fact of the matter is, is that who is the God of the Mormon Temple to you? Is it God, the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ? Is he the the the, the God of the Bible, or is he a false God, an evil evil God leading people to hell? For for me, the God of the Mormon Temple ceremony is Elohim, who's got Jehovah as his right hand man. And they're casting out Satan, saying, get thee hence, and kicking him out. You think that the Mormon God kicked Lucifer out? No, no, Peter did. So, P Peter, Peter, uh, so God sends Peter, and then Peter goes down, 
and God instructs yeah, Peter, yeah, yeah, yeah. God instructs Elohim, and Je oh, Elohim tells Jehovah to talk to Peter. Jehovah tells Peter, go down and cast Satan out. Peter goes down, cast Satan out. And but that's all that's all foolish lies and fable made up. That's not real, John. That's not real. The God of the Mormon temple is not the God of, uh, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not the biblical God. He's a false God, and he leads people into a Christless eternity. But I'm just telling you what happens in the narrative of the temple ceremony. In the narrative of the temple ceremony, I, I, I guess I have a hard time understanding your interpretation and i'm not trying to argue with you i really want to hear your full story but i do want to you know i people are going to call me like the church's best friend but i'm just trying to react just sincerely i didn't know about this before and i'm just trying to give you my sincere reaction every single thing that you did in the mormon temple ritual is anti-christ and anti-god okay and that's i, I understand that i totally understand that that's your opinion what i'm just trying to say is i can understand why the tanners had a problem with you basically saying that Lucifer is the author of the temple ceremony if literally Elohim tells Jehovah to tell Peter to go cast Lucifer out, that somehow that makes Lucifer the star and the center of Mormon theology. That seems like a huge leap. Why would, Peter be, casting, why would Peter be casting Lucifer out if— Who if, is Elohim? Uh, in Mormon theology, it's God the Father. Who was he in biblical theology? I don't, I, it depends probably on who you talk to. No, it doesn't. God. The great God. Jo God. I don't know. Well, the, the God of the Mormons, God, Elohim, is a false idol, a false God. Right. Every church is going to say the God of the other church is false. That doesn't make it true. That's just your interpretation of Christianity. No, it's the biblical interpretation of it. Right. Okay. And, sure. and, and, and the uh, you know the Ten Commandments start right off. You know, you shall not go after other gods, and he's a different god. He, you know, the, the god is the god of the Bible, the god of the universe, was not a man on some other planet, of being obedient to the laws and the orders of this gospel there, and he earned godhood. I, I, okay. With his okay. thousands of goddess wives. That's right. Not okay. God. I understand that the Mormon God that Joseph Smith taught about is violently, you know, a you know, contradictory to what a traditional Christian God is. So I, I get that. And I, I can understand. I'm just saying I understand why the Tanners felt like you you overstretched with that interpretation we're, of the temple. We're doing this without having read the article. Let's... Okay, okay. So so um I, I will acknowledge that I haven't read the article yet. Sure, sign of the nail. Okay, Live so I'll refer listeners to that, and thank you for letting me just kind of go back and forth. This isn't me trying to discredit you; it's just me trying to have a real time dialogue uh, because I, you know, I won't get this chance again, right? You know, you know, John. The the funny thing about all this is that is that these things don't matter anymore. Okay, okay. Well, I'm just trying to get the story yeah. down. And uh, the, th the things that have changed sociologically within Mormonism are, are such that finding the 4,122 errors in, of the Book of Mormon and underlining them isn't going to save anybody. Okay, no, I get that. I get that. Yeah, uh, it, it's, it, we, it, that's, we're, we're beyond all that. Okay, uh, and we'll get to, let's, let's do this. At the end, we'll talk about kind of your, your feelings about Christ and, and, resurrection and and being saved and all that so okay so let's go back you created that first pamphlet called to moroni with love is that right yeah and we handed that out uh my wife and i for a period of about six or seven years every summer we loaded up school buses full of young christian kids college students like from Biola and such and groups from churches and we went all through Utah, door to door. Was this why you were still having a full-time job, or had you made this your full-time job by that well, point? I left, I can't remember the year. I just reached a point where I could no longer do my job. And I walked away from my career and went into full-time ministry. Okay, Can I, I want to talk about that. So that's a huge leap to leave a full-time job. Like there's, there was no indication that you could make a, a living 
no. off of like trying to take people out of the Mormon church. What, what was that like to kind of take that leap of actually quitting your job? Did you have any financial indication that you could actually support yourself or was that just a leap of faith? A leap of faith, number one, I felt called of God. Uh, and, you know, we can debate that, but uh, we were not poor people. Uh, we had assets and uh, we relied upon them. And then the first couple of months that I was going out and speaking uh, publicly uh, about Mormonism, because I had opened up the churches in my area and said, I, I'm available. And everybody was jumping on it. We hadn't done the, the God make a movie at the time. And um, at any rate, uh, uh, the first meeting that I was at, uh, was it was in a uh, it was like on December the first Sunday of December and I spoke at this church and uh, as I was going out the door a guy stuck a check in my my jacket pocket because I was still wearing the suits in those days and uh, I didn't think about it until I was getting undressed at home that night and the funny thing about it is is that my daughter Stephanie who's a horsey girl and she's still a horsey grandma but she she uh she said, Dad, I, I, if for Christmas is any way I can get a new, a new halter or a new reins for my, my, uh, my horse. And I said, well, right now, honey, I don't know what we can do for Christmas. And so I opened up that check. The church had given me $500. Yeah, this back then, you know, it was a good offering. And then, and then uh, the, the, uh, the check was $1,000. And I went into my daughter's room and I said, honey, yes, I'm going to get that halter for you but is there anything else you want for christmas i was laughing because i was i felt like god was proving it well for the first three months money came in to take care of our financial needs and meet the mortgage and all the other things and we had kids in private in christian school so uh then we went through a very lean time and then i realized that if you're going to go in and serve god full-time in a non-profit uh money that comes in dis as discretionary giving because we would never take somebody's tithe. Uh, and so uh, uh, you either get in it all the way or you get out quick. And we stayed in and we used up our stock, our, 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 our assets and things like that and, and continued it. And then it built up uh, when uh, jumping ahead a little bit, when we met Dave and we wrote the book, The God Makers, and that was a struggle because Dave didn't know about Mormonism and he writes in a different format than I write. And so we had a lot of, a lot of tough times and he would only write in, uh, on a, on, on a typewriter. And I was now using a little word processor and, and it was, it was so we had a lot of confusion, but, uh, the, 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 the way the book came out was phenomenal. Uh, 800,000 copies in circulation. How long did it take you to write the book? A year took you a year yeah and you did it full time no i still talked in fact uh we had we had a place over in uh ketchum idaho um uh, a, a little summer place and i would go over there and be all alone and just write all day long for a, a month you know and and uh and do all the checking and stuff and you know and and there's so much involved because the uh, Harvest House was the uh, the the uh, company the the, the uh, publisher publisher that decided that they wanted to do that. Is that and a Christian? It, is that a Christian publisher? Yes, it is. And uh, the book is still on the shelves. You can still order it from them. That book. Do you know how many total copies have been sold of that book? I estimate uh, eight hundred thousand. Was this the is this the bestseller in his of all history for Harvest House? No, they they've they've had some big big you know big names. I wasn't a big name. So the uh, book came before the movie, is that right? Yes, and then then they wanted to do the movie. Okay, wait before we do that. What what royalties did you make if you're able or willing to share off the book? Did it? Uh, I got twenty two percent of net. So what are you are you comfortable sharing how much money that was? I don't remember how much money it was, but the the point of it, John, is that it didn't come to me. I had assigned the the uh, I now had employees. And we were rent. We we had bought a little building in the area where we lived, and the church. It was an old church, and and we 
we gathered employees. Uh, we were had a printing press in the basement, and we were printing tracks and mailing them all over the world, and doing a whole bunch of things like that. We did the, we we did a number of things, and uh, and and uh, the money for my royalties for all my books always always went to Saints Alive, not to Ed Decker. Well, who paid your salary? When there was enough money to cover the cost of the ministry and the running of the ministry. In those days, there were some very good-sized checks, and you're not going to get away from, from that. Uh, but when I say 22% of net, there were a lot of books that were being bought at 50%. So, uh, and then they take their costs, and then so the 22% of net isn't a lot of money. It's not $2.20. See, twenty-two percent of net is still a very, very high amount, and I split that with Dave Hunt. Okay? Right. But yeah, my, yeah. My my royalties and my honorariums never went to me. It would not have been bad if they had. I just yeah, want to be I, clear. I I I felt that there are ministries out there and people out there who sell. They they do a book. And they, they, um, they sell the book. They own the book. They sell the. They buy the book at seventy percent discount, which is what my discount was if I bought the book directly. And then we would then, uh, if I were doing it the way some do it, then I would sell the book to the ministry for a forty percent discount, which is what a good discount for a bookstore. And so I would make. That thirty percent of t I'd make three dollars. I'd make three dollars for every single book that I sold to the to the to the to the ministry, and that's called double dipping. Yeah, and that to me that's unconscionable, uh, and I don't have the spirit of greed, so it would never be that. We we sold stock, uh, we sold property, and think everything that we could sell at times that were rough for the ministry or that we needed special things. My wife and I pony up. My wife went to work and worked for 20 years for the city of Issaquah uh, so that our boys could go to college. Uh, there were times when I drove to town with enough, without enough money to, for gas to get back home again when I went to the post office and God always had a check or two in there was, was was this? Did you create a nonprofit or was it a for profit? Yeah, the minute we created a nonprofit in 1976. And so what? So we're, did at some point did the nonprofit pay you a salary? When there was enough money left, after I would might get paid five or six times a year, and my salary then is still my salary if I paid myself today. I never moved off thirty thousand dollars a year as income. Oh wow! Okay, and so, I just want to be clear. I yeah, I no. feel differently. I have a nonprofit. I get paid. I don't think it's wrong to get paid. Oh, so this no. isn't me treating you like you've done something wrong or accusing you. No. I just want to understand: that. Were you making six figures? Were you making millions of dollars a year? Sounds like you were making no more than thirty thousand a year from the ministry. And then where where did extra income come from? My wife's working. So she's supporting you. So she's kind of a unsung and, hero in all this for those who like what you've done. She says that I, she could care less about the Mormons. She says that I have a ministry to the Mormons and she has a ministry to me. Wow. You know, and, and that's, and she did all the finances. I never touched the money. My wife became very, very ill in 19, I mean, in 2016 and went through seven heart surgeries, uh, came, came home with failing liver, failing failing uh, uh, kidneys, uh, uh, congestive heart failure, dementia, and a number of other things. And uh, since that time, we live a quiet life. Uh, okay, wait, you're getting ahead of here. <laughs> well, I can't help it. <laughs> okay, okay. So so we'll come back to this. So, so you published this book. Did you have any idea how big it was going to get when you published it? No. Yeah, because that's that's a that's a big thing. I mean, it became a national phenomenon, right? It was the number one. Uh, it it was for almost a year. It was for like several months. I can't remember the exact stats on it, 
for several months, it was the number one Christian book in America. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it beat out uh, uh, who's the guy for the 700 Club. Uh, no. Baldwell. No, Pat. Pat Robertson. Pat Robertson had a book out that year, and he was number two. And, wow. And we were number, and then for several years, we were in the top five. And then for a number of years, like for 10 years, we were, I think, like in the top 10 or 20. So know, a super uh, successful book. Very successful book. And it really changed the way the world looked at Mormonism. Okay. So, yeah, for sure. Really quickly, um, one of the, and we'll get to this with the, with the movie, but, you know, a couple of things I want to ask about. So during the 60s, this journal called Dialogue uh, emerged, which was an attempt to bring academic rigor to Mormonism. And it, somewhere around the early 70s, 72-ish, this guy named Leonard Arrington became church historian and started hiring people like Michael Quinn to do kind of serious, rigorous Mormon history. Yes. And then like in the mid-70s, Sunstone uh, gets formed. And so by the late 70s, which is when, and of course the Tanners were really chugging, so by the time you're you're writing the Godmakers, there's this kind of underground or this sort of surfacing, you know, decade or decade and a half of attempts to bring a lot of historical rigor, uh, academic rigor to Mormon studies. Yes. When you public when you wrote the Godmakers, were you aware of all that going on? Were you plugged into yeah. it at all? Well, I, in fact, they, Sunstone put out a a request for papers to present at the Sunstone Symposium. And I can't remember the year. And Peggy Fletcher. No, but staff. is this before you wrote the book? Because I'm talking about when you wrote the book. No, that was not before I wrote the book. Okay, I don't, I just want to stick to the timeline a little bit. So when you wrote the book, were you aware of D. Michael Quinn, of Leonard Arrington, of... of well, uh, yeah, Leonard, you know, yeah. Uh, and, and um, you know, of course, uh, Quinn, of course, uh, made himself, you know, unloved of the church when he wrote uh, uh, magic, Mormon magic and whatever it was. Right. But I'm what I'm trying to get to is there have been criticisms about the God makers that it that there are some errors or inaccuracies or exaggerations. And I'm wondering if you how much you were sort of plugged into the academic, if you were even aware of the academic Mormon history crowd at the time you wrote it, or if you're just sort of like a born again ex Mormon that's just going to do your best to interpret the scriptures, but not trying to, or even aware of the more rigorous academic community emerging around Mormon studies. No, I wasn't really aware of it in that sense. I knew, I, I think I've, I read a, a, a Sunstone or I, you know, when they came out, I mean, I was aware of it. But the, but what I did had nothing to do with that. I and and uh, the accusations of inaccuracy are so ludicrous that I, for forty years, have stated to people, uh, they say the God makers is full of in, uh, of lies and misrepresentations and inaccuracies. And I say, go bring me your top three, your top three worst inaccuracies, worst misrepresentations worst lies, the worst bad things that you're saying about the, about the Godmaker book, you bring me there, bring me those accusations, and I will give you the specific doctrines out of Mormon manuscripts and books and published pieces that will stand up in a court of law. And if, and if I do that, number one, you leave the church and, and admit that I'm right. If you can give me something out of the Godmakers that I can't prove that would stand up in a court of law with Mormon original documents, then I'll shut down the state. Okay, law. okay. So t tell us. Not one time. Not one for, time. Okay, so I hear what you're saying. What you're saying is, is you still stand by Every what's word. written in the Godmakers. Yes. Okay, as accurate as factual. It uh, was called... What? The truth about the God makers. They put out a book. Right. That cost more money than the God maker book, incidentally, but they put out a book called The Truth About the God Makers. It was so ludicrously put together uh, and, and, and so such an amateur job that I wouldn't respond to it for over a year. Then I finally responded to it, and it's on my website. 
and it's called the truth about the truth about the God maker. <laughs> and, it's, and, and it's a very short thing because it was such a piece of, of, of you know, created faith and people bought the books by the thousands. And sometimes I would ask the person who was challenged me, who, who had the book, I'd say, what page are you reading it from? They had the book. It was a, it, it was something that was like a talisman. They held it. It was, it was, it proved that I was wrong. But right. Were, most yeah. Of them and that's the book. Yeah. When you read like Hugh Nibley's response to no man knows my history, it's stupid. It's, it's ridiculous. It's embarrassing. And yeah, Mormon church apologists have a history of doing an awful job responding to criticisms in ways that actually undermine their own cause. But let me just ask you to do us a favor. For those who have attacked the Godmaker's book, and we'll get to the book before we get to the movie, can you tell us, let's just say, the three biggest uh, criticisms they've had on its accuracy? Well, one of the I still get today, and, and, and I, I got to remember that I'm 85, so uh, my mind is down about 30%. Um, that's pretty one, good. And one, one of them has said, you know, uh, you quote Joseph Smith saying, I have done more than anyone, uh, including Jesus Christ. No, he said that. And, and, and uh, they say, this is, he said, I've done more, save, or they, it, it, I think it's in a pearly great price. He has done more, somebody speaking about him, save Jesus Christ than anyone on earth. And I, and I say, that, that's a proof that I'm, that I, I I lied and I misrepresented and misquoted. Okay, that's a dumb one. What yeah. what were some of the other ones that they that they uh, accuracies that they accused you of? Do you remember the temple rituals? The temple rituals. What about them? What that, about them? Uh, they don't take the blood oaths and they don't do these kinds of things. And oh, they they tried to claim that we didn't do the blood oaths. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's and, silly. Uh, and and that uh, that we didn't have to wear the garments twenty four hours a day. You know, and I said. You're talking to a guy that wore them. I used to shower <laughs> in them. Okay, know. so a lot of the responses just tried to deny reality, it sounds like. Um, I remember, I'll just tell you really quickly a funny story for me. So I, I'm at BYU in 87 and 88. I haven't seen the Godmakers because I was warned it's evil, you should never see it, which in and of itself is interesting. If the church had nothing to hide, they would say, tell everyone to see it so that you could become educated about it. And and notice all the lies, but the church didn't do that. The church labeled it as evil and anti-Mormon, so I was afraid to watch it. And so, um, but but somehow I had come across the book, the truth of the truth about the God Makers, and I had read that I had read that you had made the the uh, claim that Adam and Eve that that in the Mormon that, that the Mormon temple clothing you had to wear a green apron, and I remember when somebody mentioned that. Having never been through the temple, I remember saying, you don't wear a green apron in the temple. That's a lie. All you wear in the temple is white because I've been in the temple and all I wear was white. And I just, I just remember then later when I went through and I had to put on a green apron, realizing that I'd attacked you and your work out of ignorance, <laughs> out of oh. total ignorance. So anyway. Um, I, I, I can take the heat. <laughs> no. Okay. So, so. Um, so the attacks on the God makers were, were silly. Um, it sounds like on the book, tell us how you, you turned the book into a movie. How'd that happen? Well, I got, it happened when, uh, Jeremiah films, um, Pat Matriciana approached me and said, I'd really like to make a movie out of the God makers. And we raised a quarter of a million dollars. I put a, I had to get a uh, second mortgage on my home to, to, to get all the money. And we, we, uh, we borrowed money from a lot of the ex Mormons. And we were, you know, we were paying as high as 13% interest to, on some of the loans because that's what it was back then. And, um, and so we raised the money and we did the movie. Uh, and it was in 16 millimeter. And we had about a 500, eventually we started out with 200 re, uh, uh, films and we advertised and we went to churches and we showed the film. Again, it was on the big, the big, big reel. And uh, then we would, uh, 
then we would have a question and answer time after. Right. So how much, what was the budget of the movie? A quarter of a million dollars. It was a quarter of a million dollars. That's a lot. Um, yeah. Okay. I, for, for those who are listening, I, I mentioned this at the beginning, but I'm going to mention all the issues that the God, God, God makers, the book and God makers, the movie, I'm going to mention all the issues that you bring up. And um, I just, I just want people, there are a lot of people that want to, you know, all of us are flawed. All of us are doing our best. I'm not going to say that you're a flawless man or an awful man. I'm not. I'm not. Right. I make some mistakes. Right. Like everybody else. Yeah. But, but I, I, you know, there are people that want to just say, don't even talk to Ed Decker. Don't even listen to him. He's a liar. He's dishonest. He's deceitful, blah, blah, blah. What I want to call people's attention to uh, and why I'm interviewing you is because I, I, it took me until like the, I want to say 10, 15 years ago where I actually watched the God makers. I was still active in the church. I was living in Logan, Utah, ironically, and it was somewhere on YouTube. And so I watched the God makers for the first time. And I expected, you know, I expected it to be just silly and, and, and totally non-credible and just a bunch of hateful silliness. Um, and even, you know, and, and I, even though when I watched it, I wasn't a believer anymore, but I was still so, uh, I was still so influenced by all the anti God makers rhetoric that I was just expecting there to be nothing of value or worth within it. And so I want everyone to sort of put their mindset back in the late seventies, early eighties. This is pre-internet, pre-CES letter, pre-Mormon stories. You know, this is pre, pre everything. So, so much of the pr privilege that we have now. You know, this, these are the issues that Ed Decker confronts in the God makers publicly for the first time in sort of, uh, I don't know, U S church consciousness. Okay. That's right. He, he, Ed Decker, you, you talk about the temple ceremony, how the temple ceremony came from the Masonic lodge and how it had blood oaths and, and really heinous sort of violent, dark kind of rituals. True. True. Listeners. Credible? Yes, that's a credible issue. Number two, you call attention to the fact that Joseph Smith taught that there were, you know, many gods, that, that God was a God, that Jesus was a God, and that men can become gods. Uh, you taught that, right? Absolutely. And it was a big issue, and, I'll, and we all know it was a huge issue, because it got to the point in the 80s and 90s where Hinckley was asked on 60 Minutes, is it true that Mormons teach that, you know, man can become a God. And of course, Hinckley, you basically right. caused Hinckley to lie on public television and, and basically suggest to the world, that's a silly little, you know, couplet. And that's not what Mormons believe. Ha ha ha. And then he goes back to general conference later and, and then tries to, you know, when all the Mormons are saying, wait a minute, Gordon Me, why are you telling the public one thing? And we've all been taught this for century, you know, a century and a half. The other, Gordon B. Hingley says, you, you members know what I meant. And he kind of winks and everybody laughs. I mean, that was a really important moment in Mormon history. Yeah. And I would have to say you were probably a part of that, right? That's right. Yeah. You actually caused a Mormon prophet to oh, sort wow. of like deceive the world and denounce uh, one of our core doctrinal tenets. True? True. That's a big deal. Okay. And, and, and that animated segment, we're going to talk about that. I'm going to come back to that. But there's this whole animated segment that looks like it's from a Hanna-Barbera cartoon. It was, yeah. <laughs> you know, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, that was a, a, that was a funny thing. And we took uh, the law of eternal progression as man is, God once was, and as God is, man may become. And we created a seven-minute uh, uh, little uh, cartoon strip out of it. And um, it, it was probably the most shocking. I wrote a book called The Mormon Dilemma. And it's a story about a Christian neighbor of a Mormon couple. And we did the movie called The Mormon Dilemma from that, from the book. and and. They got a hold of that cartoon thing, and it, they said every bit of it was a lie. And so the, the friend goes through each segment of it 
and says, do you believe this? And do you believe that? And they broke it down into about eight, 10 different sections. And in each case, they said, well, yeah, we believe that. But when you put it together in that very offensive seven minute cartoon, it drove Mormons insane. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just say just to just to sort of validate, like I've seen that cartoon. I just pasted it in the, the comment section of this video. And I, I remember watching it and going, yep, we believe that. Yep. We believe that God's a God, that Jesus is a God. Yep. We believe that men can become God. Yes. We believe that men will have plural wives in the afterlife. Yes, we, you know, believe that a woman's role is to have eternal offspring, spiritual offspring. Like, it was all true, but everyone lost their mind because it, it, they didn't like how, what was brilliant about that cartoon, to me, was that it's one thing to sort of believe this behind the scenes, but nobody had ever put it together in a sort of complete six-minute yeah. narrative that really sort of like made you think about the implications and kind of the silliness or the absurdity of it all. And then nobody wanted it talked about publicly because there's this whole within Mormonism, like sacred, not secret. And like, these are some of our, like the second anointing, these are some of our more sensitive teachings and they're making fun of us. And we don't like how it sounds to people well, outside. Uh, Marky Peterson uh, came to, Seattle area and to my stake and during a state conference uh, talked about this and he said that I was a son of perdition and 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 uh, doomed to the outer darkness because of my evil things and that the church would continue to move on and the yapping dog would have no effect <laughs> you know so the, the whole point about it is is that three or four people wanted to know who this evil person was and they contacted me and I ended up giving them materials that could help them understand the church. All uh, right. Well, let's do this. If, you, if you're willing, let's do something that I didn't plan on doing. That's probably never been done before, but let's play the video for our, for our, uh, the cartoon for our uh, listening audience. Do that. And, and let's, you know, let's just let people, let's just let people judge for themselves how, how accurate it is of, of Mormon theology and doctrine from way back when. Is that okay? Yeah, that's good with me. It's, it's, it's accurate. It's offensive. It's offensive, but it's true. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, you know. Uh, yeah. So let's play it. And then I'm going to have you, I'm, you know, we'll comment about it as, as we play it. Is that okay? That's great. All right. So I'm going to say share computer sound. I'm going to share uh, this and then I'll, I'll hit play. Here we go, everyone. We are playing the cartoon from the Godmakers with Ed Decker, and, and it'll be six and a half minutes long, and then we'll comment about it. Mormonism teaches that trillions of planets scattered throughout the cosmos are ruled by countless gods who once were human like us. They say that long ago on one of these planets, to an unidentified god and one of his goddess wives, a spirit child named Elohim was conceived. This spirit child was later born to human parents who gave him a physical body. Through obedience to Mormon teaching and death and resurrection, he proved himself worthy and was elevated to godhood as his father before him. Mormons believe that Elohim is their heavenly father and that he lives with his many goddess wives on a planet near a mysterious star called Korah. Here, the god of Mormonism and his wives through endless celestial sex produced billions of spirit children. To decide their destiny, the head of the Mormon gods called a great heavenly council meeting. Both of Elohim's eldest sons were there. Lucifer and his brother Jesus. A plan was presented to build planet Earth, where the spirit children would be sent to take on mortal bodies and learn good from evil. Lucifer stood and made his bid for becoming savior of this new world. Wanting the glory for himself, he planned to force everyone to become gods. 
Opposing the idea, the Mormon Jesus suggested giving man his freedom of choice, as on other planets. The vote that followed approved the proposal of the Mormon Jesus, who would become savior of the planet Earth. Enraged, Lucifer cunningly convinced one-third of the spirits destined for Earth to fight with him in revolt. Thus, Lucifer became the devil and his followers the demons. Sent to this world, they would forever be denied bodies of flesh and bone. Those who remained neutral in the battle were cursed to be born with black skin. This is the Mormon explanation for the Negro race. The spirits that fought most valiantly against Lucifer would be born into Mormon families on planet Earth. These would be the lighter skinned people, or white and delightsome, as the Book of Mormon describes them. Early Mormon prophets taught that Elohim and one of his goddess wives came to Earth as Adam and Eve to start the human race. Thousands of years later, Elohim, in human form once again, journeyed to Earth from the starbase Kolob, this time to have sex with the Virgin Mary, in order to provide Jesus with a physical body. Mormon apostle Orson Pratt taught that after Jesus Christ grew to manhood, he took at least three wives, Mary, Martha, and Mary Magdalene. Through these wives, the Mormon Jesus, for whom Joseph Smith claimed direct descent, supposedly fathered a number of children before he was crucified. According to the Book of Mormon, after his resurrection, Jesus came to the Americas to preach to the Indians, who the Mormons believe are really Israelites. Thus, the Jesus of Mormonism established his church in the Americas as he had in Palestine. By the year 421 AD, the dark-skinned Indian Israelites, known as Lamanites, had destroyed all of the white Nephites in a number of great battles. The Nephites' records were supposedly written on golden plates and buried by Moroni, the last living Nephite in the hill Cumorah. 1,400 years later, a young treasure seeker named Joseph Smith, who was known for his tall tales, claimed to have uncovered these same gold plates near his home in upstate New York. He is now honored by Mormons as a prophet because he claimed to have had visions from the spirit world in which he was commanded to organize the Mormon church because all Christian creeds were an abomination. It was Joseph Smith who originated most of these peculiar doctrines which millions today believe to be true. By maintaining a rigid code of financial and moral requirements and through performing sacred temple rituals for themselves and the dead, the Latter-day Saints hope to prove their worthiness and thus become gods. The Mormons teach that everyone must stand at the final judgment before Joseph Smith, the Mormon Jesus, and Elohim. Those Mormons who were sealed in the eternal marriage ceremony expect to become polygamous gods in the celestial kingdom, rule over other planets, and spawn new families throughout eternity. The Mormons thank God for Joseph Smith, who claimed that he had done more for us than any other man, including Jesus Christ. The Mormons believe that he died as a martyr, shed his blood for us, so that we too may become gods.